Welcome to the Retirement Lifestyle Show. I'm your host, Roshan Lungani, here with my co-host, Eric Olson. And Adrian is not with us today. He is on vacation, so he's really missing out. I'm excited about our topic today. We at the Retirement Lifestyle Show want to make sure that you live happy and healthy lives. Part of that is definitely managing your money and the finance side of things that you will put, put your mind at ease. But we also want to make sure you're taking care of yourself, both uh, you know, physically, mentally, in all aspects. And we have a very special guest with us today. We've got Jill Myers here. She's with uh, Yodea Wellness. And Jill, please correct me if I said it incorrectly. But she is an integrative nutrition health coach. So she's here to help you make sure you take care of, uh, take care of yourself physically. So Jill, how are you? I am doing great today. You Thank guys? you so much for joining us. We appreciate you you joining us today. The first question I think all of our listeners need to know is, what does an integrative nutrition health coach do for you? So an integrative nutrition health coach um, is someone that you would work with to look at your health holistically. Many people think of health as disease or lack of disease. But when you look at health overall, you're looking at your body, your mind, your spirit, your mental health, and there are a lot of factors that go into that. And if you're struggling with problems, um, an integrative nutrition health coach can help you work on your goals and figure out what really is at the, at the root of what you're trying to accomplish. So for an example, you may be a diabetic patient and you go into a doctor's office and they say, you know what? Roshan, you really would you know, help your diabetes if you could lose 20 pounds. Here's your insulin prescription, you know, we'll see you in six months. And you walk out of the office and you're like, okay, I need to lose weight, but how do I even go about that? I've tried 10 diets, they don't work. Like, I really don't know what else to do. And so a coach can help you kind of look at your goals and look at all the factors in your life because health is more than just you know, lack of disease. There's you know, from things like your blood pressure and things like that, but there's a lot of other factors. You know, are, are you a happy person? Are you, do you have a positive mindset? Are you happy in your job? All these other things really factor into how your body functions, and those are different aspects that a, a health coach would work on with you that you don't get in your 15 minutes in the doctor's office. Uh, that's great, and Jill, you mentioned um weight loss i think right around now new year's resolution time uh if i remember the the numbers correctly i think it's almost 70 percent of people's resolutions are around um weight loss and getting healthy so let's just say it's a new year's it's my resolution i call you and i say i want to get healthy where do we start so the first thing I would do is set a time to meet with you and go over um, what we call a health history. And it kind of goes through your, your past, um, your, your family's health, health uh, history, your health history, your habits, how you eat, when you eat, how you exercise, and just a lot of background information. And then we would, if we decide to work together, we would put down some goals. And those goals would come from you. And it might be, hey, I want to lose 20 pounds. And my next question would be, why? What's the why behind why you want to do this? Because often like, people know they want to lose weight, but it might be because I want to be able to play with my children, or I want to be able to run that 10K, or I want to look better in the dress for my son's wedding next month. You know, there's a lot of different um, whys behind, you know, people's motivation behind just losing weight. And when you're so focused on just the pounds coming off and I got to fit into these jeans or fit into this dress you don't always have the motivation but if you can get behind what's that what's really the reason you know I want to be able to live longer I want to be able to see my kids graduate high school I want to you know have grandchildren one day and be able to get on the floor and play with them often if you can get to those deeper whys people may be more motivated there, there's a longer term goal that can help them build sustainable habits to achieve those goals so what are um, some of those sustainable habits that that um, I know this is a general question and everyone's different but there's got to be some commonality with habits that that people can improve I have a friend who's a doctor once that said uh, 
that like if 70% of her patients lost weight, they'd feel so much better, right? Mm -hmm. Now I know that's just a general <laughs> number, but are there common things that people tend to be missing? Well, there's some basics that I think are maybe low hanging fruit that some people don't pay attention to. Um, so the couple that I would first go to is, what are you drinking? Are you hydrating with water on a regular basis um, to hydrate all the cells in your body? I mean, sometimes people go through the day and they have three cups of coffee, they have the diet soda, um, then they're having the, the latte in the afternoon and they're having a beer with dinner and those liquids are not nourishing the body, they're not hydrating the cells in your body. And so just moving, adding an extra cup of water a day, adding two cups of water a day. And, and it's often people have trouble, it's like oh, I have to get rid of all of my coffee. Oh my God, cut out all the alcohol. Well, we talk about something called crowding out. Just swap out one cup of coffee in the morning for warm water with lemon juice which can detoxify your, your body, add in more hydration. So the, the water, the simple thing, <laughs> um, it sounds so easy, but so many people don't do it. And when you get hungry or you feel that hunger, oftentimes you're thirsty and you're already dehydrated. So that's one that's just a, a low hanging fruit that people can start you know, just drinking more water. Um, the second one for me is moving your body. And often, you know, we're sitting here on this podcast, we're sitting in chairs, um, you sit at your desk at your computers, especially in your field, you know, you're working with people and you're in front of the computer with, um, you know, the spreadsheets and the, the market and things like that up. Um, and most people that work in an office, they're sitting most of the day. And then we come home and you might be sitting for dinner and then sitting on the couch. And it's hard to put activity into your day. So even if just like simple things to add in, take the stairs do some squats in the morning when you get up um, in the middle of the day get out of your chair set your fitbit or your you know clock or a timer um, move every hour even if it's just for five minutes get up and stretch um, open your hip flexors because you're sitting all day and that can add to lower back pain um, go for a walk especially in the winter um, i was out earlier today um, get outside get fresh air and there's so many different ways that you can add movement into your life um, that don't have to be the gym membership and running five miles, you know, little things. Take the elevator instead of the stairs. Park further away in the parking lot. And if you start to look at those things throughout your day and throughout your life, you can increase your movement. Um, and, and the reason for that, and you talk about this as a retirement living show, as we get older, our bodies are more sedentary often. And if you want to be able to, what I call, functionally move, you know, can you get, when you're 80 years old, are you able to get off the toilet without assistance? Are you able to pick up your grocery bag and buy your own, you know, bring your own groceries in and put them away? So, you know, I'm looking forward, you know, 30 years from now, I want to be able to live independently. I want to be able to live healthy through my retirement and be able to do my daily functions. It's really functional movement. Um, so doing those things, on a daily basis now um, will keep your body in motion and your muscles and your tendons and cartilage and everything able to do that over time. We lose so much of our muscle mass um, as we age, so if you're not moving, you're losing even more instead of trying to you know, improve or at least hold the gains that you have now. So the hydration and movement are two simple things that people can do. They don't, they don't need anything other than their own desire to do it. And the last one um, that we say is just eat more greens. <laughs> you know, add a few more servings of you know vegetables, whether it's you know a kale smoothie or you know have a salad for lunch. Um, there's so many ways to add vegetables into your diet. They're you know low glycemic, so for people who have issues, um, those can be added in. And there's just so many ways to add those into your diet. And you know, oh, I don't want to eat spinach, so throw it in your mashed potatoes, you know, <laughs> chop it up, you're still going to get the nutrients. Um, but just trying to shift little bits of habits can make a huge difference over a long term. Roshan, uh, did you have another question you wanted to I, pose? I go do, ahead. Please go ahead. <laughs> no, 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 you, I, I was, well, you, when you mentioned um, eating more greens and, and sort of chopping it up, it reminds me of what we do with uh, spaghetti sauce with my kids sometimes sneaking those things in. <laughs> uh, but I thought of one other thing then um, when you were talking about eating and just eating eating more, um, supplements. There's so many supplements on the market and you hear uh, 
about them. And someone like me, I don't like I would just if someone says I need a supplement, I would probably spend 10 seconds looking up online and then get whatever Amazon said had the most stars, which is probably not the best way to do it. So what what are your thoughts on supplements from you know vitamins to the powders you can add to everything now? Um, I don't even know where to start with the question there. I'll just <laughs> let you pick it up. So supplements are an interesting um, topic. Um, they have their place. Um, there's Most of them are not regulated, so you don't always know what you're getting. Um, you really should work with a practitioner. Like, why are you taking the supplement? What are you looking to add into your body? If you're able to get things from the food um, that you eat, that's probably the first place to go. And here, I'll give you an example. Over the summer, um, we did lab work at my last physical, and my iron count was low. And we were trying to figure out, okay, what, what's driving that? Um, you should probably supplement with iron. And so the first thing we looked at is what's my diet? Are there foods that I can increase um, to add more in? Now, I stopped eating red meat over the last few years, and that could be part of it. I also had donated blood right before my lab work, so maybe mm. that was part of it. But the first thing I looked to is I went online and you know typed in iron-rich foods, and I started to add in some more of those to help. Um, so a lot of times it would be helpful to have a really good set of lab work done to see what your body's really deficient in before you start adding supplements in and working with a practitioner who's knowledgeable about you know which brands which brands they trust there are some that have um, there's all kinds of um, I don't want to say different grades but ratings and you know vetting how they produce their supplements what they're made of there's some brands that are made from actually whole foods but they're you know in a capsule for you to take and you know, in, in my learning, what we talked about is getting rid of all the supplements that you're taking and see how you feel. And then add back one at a time and see, does it make a difference for you? I mean, some people take a daily vitamin just as that insurance, well, maybe I'm not getting everything I need from my diet, so I'm just gonna take that um, on a daily basis. And that's you know, a, a really good quality multivitamin could be helpful. Um, I would say the first line is to try and go with real food first. Um, but the, one of the issues <laughs> you know, with food is that the food source, the soil it comes from, um, do you know where your food's coming from? Is it organic? Is it you know, conventionally farmed? There's so many factors that go into, you know, does the food you're eating actually have the nutrients in it that you need? So I think supplements do have their place for certain things at certain times. Um, I'm not sure that you need to be on X supplement like for the rest of your life. Um, so working with a practitioner who's knowledgeable in that area can really be helpful. And you mentioned organic food as well. Um, is is it worth the money to go organic? Yeah, it's <laughs> always. I always feel like it's it's so much cheaper to eat unhealthy, <laughs> right? Right. So, well, well you know, were they come out with organic Twinkies, Roshan, it'll be a, yeah. a breakthrough. <laughs> I mean, I give it a try. <laughs> so, you know, there, there's a lot of controversy out there. And, you know, if you go on Netflix, you can see a lot of different shows about organic farming and, and, and different things. Um, there are places that you can look online for what they call the dirty dozen. And there are certain uh, fruits and vegetables that are considered the ones that you should absolutely buy organic, and I know blueberries absolutely is on the top of the list, um, mm -hmm. because when they're farming and they're using pesticides, the food, the fruits and vegetables that grab the most or have the most pesticides in it based on, you know, you pick blueberries, they're exposed, for example. If you eat a banana, you're eating the inside, so even though it's grown with pesticides, you may not ingest as much of it if, you know, you're eating things that are within a shell, if you will. Um, so the, I think it's the Environmental Working Group has a dirty dozens list. And they update it every year based on, I guess, different studies they do on the things that if you're going to spend the money for organic, which ones are the, the critical ones? I know apples are on that list as well. Um, and I actually have shifted over the last year to buying more organic because when you start to learn about the pesticides, and it's not so much you know which has more nutrients and they've done studies, well, you're still getting the same amount of vitamin C from it or whatever. Um, but what are the pesticides doing to your body? And when you start going down that road and looking into a lot of this information, when you get more information, sometimes it's really scary uh, what we put in our bodies. 
um, and how it can interact with your hormones and just sometimes the more knowledge you have, you kind of wonder, you know, well, what can I eat? Um, but there are ways to help keep your body healthy and, you know, eat the things that you can. The other thing is that we talk about is you might spend a little bit more on food today, but if you're eating healthier, eating cleaner, the long-term impact of that hopefully will keep you healthier so you have less health care costs and less impaired ability to live healthily over the long term. So I'm, I'm at the point now where I spend a little bit more on my food now and I'll spend in the middle of the winter <laughs> $7.99 at Trader Joe's for blueberries um, because I want to have you know the blueberries with my morning oatmeal um, and hope that over time by putting less toxins into my body, I'm staying healthier for the long term, and then my health care costs over the long term will be less. Hmm. So, Jill, I, I would just, I'm thinking about questions, but maybe uh, I'll, I'll start by just telling a story. So, my grandparents, I don't know my, I don't know my paternal grandmother's physical condition because she passed away when my dad was very young. So, but I know of the other three grandparents, one was wiry, wiry two were heavy. And uh, of my own parents, one was mm, modestly overweight, so, but she was part of Weight Watchers and the accountability that she had in that uh, fellowship really worked for her and she endeavored uh, to, to stay healthy. But my dad, uh, my dad did not, so he was, he was kind of on the heavy side. So when I saw my numbers start to go up, when it, through the course of my life, and they started showing more and more of the, the pre-diabetic indicators. AC1 numbers started, I think, to get a little high and what have you. Uh, triglycerides were getting a little high. Um, my doctor said, hey, you can either solve this with, you, can, you, you know, your, it's your choice, but diet and exercise or drugs. And then the first time that he said that, at the time that he said that, I said, well, let's just do the drugs. Because I was thinking, you know, I don't have the time for it. Because I was, it was just so easy for me to rationalize. But after a few years of that, another doctor looked at it and he said, no, we're not going to do the drugs. You're going to do the diet and exercise. <laughs> and so I grumbled a little bit. But I said, okay, I've got to, I've got to figure out how to do this. <clears throat> and it was almost out of, I was all, there was a part of me that was thinking, I'm going to show him diet and exercise doesn't work, so he'll put me on the drugs again. I mean, kind of a sick, a sick mentality about it all. But you know, he was right, and so I started figuring out. Okay, let's let's go on each of these measures. What am I going to do first on the exercise side? And I'm going to tell just part of the story is to tee up for you to comment on it. And you may. And there, by the way, we have no reservations about people disagreeing with us vehemently on these on these uh, podcasts so you can say Eric that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard and you can say that <laughs> anything I say totally fine we love it um, but what I I started doing some reading initially I went to the gym and I started I hit the treadmill and I was thinking I hate this treadmill so much this is the most boring thing I've ever done in my life I've got <laughs> to find something else that will work for me and I was thinking swimming, because I had once upon a time really loved swimming, but I chanced upon this, this book that prior to recommending in a protocol, rec discussed the science of, of exercise physiology. And what it said was, is that particularly for those people where an element of their goal is to drop um, fat, not necessarily drop weight, but to drop fat, and that was an issue in my case, that the, the best way to do that would be to find a form of exercise that would build lean muscle mass so that the additional lean muscle, muscle mass could aid in the um, pace at which you could deplete that fat or, or that oversupply of fat. And it also, and so specifically it was going to be strength training. And then furthermore, it said there is some uh, post-exercise excess calorie consumption phenomenon which persists more for those that are doing strength training than for those that are doing um, aerobic training. In other words, when you finish aerobics, 
that excess cal caloric depletion ceases until the next exercise session, whereas for the person who has a weight training, there's a persistent elevated consumption of excess calories above your base metabolism. I thought, wait a second, there's two wins there. If I can add 10 pounds of muscle, that'll be burning X number of calories per year that I, other, that I can therefore consume again in the form of pizza and my other favorite vices. <laughs> As well as I'll have that excess, uh, that excess post exercise caloric consumption. So I started pursuing weight training and, and have persisted in that. And it's been enormously beneficial to me, both from the amount of um, total weight, but especially about 30 or 40 pounds of fat that I was able to drop. And um, it just it overall improved my energy and it improved my mood. So on that initial question there's actually three parts of that story that i think are relevant number one is, is the psychology of moving from a sedentary approach to an exercise lifestyle and the shift in thinking and moving from hating it to loving it and then the second is the the, the choice between an aerobic versus an anaerobic or strength training oriented um, approach to things do you have any sort of thoughts or re reflections or, or reprimands about any of that? <laughs> so if you're working out extra to eat the pizza, <laughs> I'm not sure that's the place I would go. But Okay, uh, uh, reprimand think... number one, duly noted. Okay, <laughs> good, let's keep going. So um, on the, the sedentary to movement, I think there are so many ways to move your body. And you know, this shouldn't be something that, or you don't want it to be something that's grueling. And I, I totally agree with you about the treadmill. I can't stand going into the gym and standing on the treadmill and I watch the numbers go and I'm like, I'm so bored, even though if I'm looking out the window. Mm -hmm. So I go outside instead. And that's what, you know, it's free. I walk out my front door with a pair of shoes and I actually used to just walk and I can now jog about two thirds of the way around my loop, which is about a third of a mile, so I'm getting about two thirds of a third of a mile. But then, you know, I start, stop, start, stop, and it's more like a hit workout, the high intensity workout. Mm -hmm. um, but it's really about finding something that you love. So, I think people need to get out of, think out of the box. You know, maybe you try a Zumba class. Maybe you just dance in your kitchen while you're cooking. Um, you know, put on your favorite music and and do, you know, a, a workout at home with a, a jump rope. Um, go hiking. There are so many different ways to move your body. We need to get out of the thinking that it has to be in the gym, in the traditional, you know, it's a, it's a class or I have to be on a piece of equipment. There's so many different ways to move your body. Um, but it's all about finding something that you love. You know, maybe you love the pool as a kid and you love to swim or you want to be out in nature and you love hiking and you can get your heart rate up with the hiking. Um, I actually hike, um, every weekend in local parks and I take my hiking poles with me. So, you know, sometimes I look like, okay, why am I taking my hiking poles? This is not a difficult hike, but it adds the upper body motion and additional aerobic workout for that. Um, so it's really about finding something that speaks to you and, and a way to move your body that you love and to kind of get out of the thought of this is exercise and it's something I have to do to find a way to move your body. And that's why I actually stopped talking about it as exercise. I talk about it as physical activity or movement, body mm. movement, mm. because it's really about moving your body, getting off the chair, getting off the couch. And whether you know, you're know you watching that football game and at the you know the commercial breaks or whatever, get up and do 10 jumping jacks, you know, or you know, run around the block during halftime. <laughs> you know, anything that increases um, the movement of your body, which actually moves the oxygen through all your cells, helps oxygenate the cells in your brain, which is a whole nother topic on brain health. Um, but instead of viewing it as this, oh, I have to exercise, it's how can I move my body that makes me feel good? And finding something that works for you. And that's really over all of these health discussions. It's so individual. You know, what works for one person doesn't necessarily work for the next person. And finding something that works for you, I think, is, is the really important thing there. Um, on the second topic of the aerobic versus anaerobic, um, it's interesting that you asked that because I used to do yoga religiously. I did two or three classes a week, and that's all I did for several years. And then I got to the point where I was having trouble lifting things and my strength wasn't there. And in talking to several different practitioners, whether it was somebody I went to a massage for, or a chiropractor, 
the repetitive motion is a, a concern because you're putting too much pressure on the same muscles and the same joints all the time. So I now, instead of you know, choosing X or Y, you know, am, I, am I gonna go for a run or am I gonna lift weights, what's my workout gonna be? Over the course of the week, I try to incorporate a lot of different things. And I actually, I don't, I, I'm not a, a routine person. I don't have a every day, this is what I do. I kind of get up in the morning, it's like, how does my body feel? And I give myself an hour or so, somewhere during the day, to do some type of movement. So on Monday morning, it might be a 20 minute yoga from a free thing that I find on YouTube. Um, I have a specific Pilates workout that I have, so maybe that's my Tuesday morning where I'm doing much more intense um, work more so than the yoga. Um, I try and get a walk in every day and sometimes it's only 20 minutes because I've got back to back meetings and sometimes it's an hour and I'm listening to your podcast mm -hmm. or you know I'm talking to a friend and, and I'm jogging through part of it. Um, I have two classes that I do from my gym two days a week and one is um, with one of these big um, the aerobic uh, what are they called the stability balls. And so, you know, I'm like this, lifting my hands up and up and up. And I thought, oh, well, this isn't hard. Well, let me tell you, the next day, <laughs> I could move my arms. Um, and, you know, doing squats. Um, I have small hand weights, and part of the workout is working with weights. So I think it's really important to vary your workouts. So, you know, if you're a runner and you're constantly pounding on those legs and those leg muscles, what are you doing for your upper body and your, you know, the strength of your arms? Um, so I think it's really important to vary your workouts, um, do some cardio, do some weight training, because over time you need to keep the strength in your hands to open the jar. You know, I keep thinking about you know my parents in their older years; they can't open the jar to you know when they want to eat something. Um, those basic things um, you need to use all of the muscles in your body throughout your day or your week, and and really move everything in different ways. You need to exercise your heart, you need to exercise your lungs, you need to exercise all your muscles, you know, strength training. So finding several things that you like. Um, I mean, with the, with the pandemic, I haven't been inside the gym since February, but I actually took one in my extra spare bedroom and I bought a step and a stability ball and I had my yoga mat and three pound weights and I'm able to do a whole lot of things in that space and I put, I put a little uh, piece of furniture in the corner and I put a plant on it it looks out onto a window and I go in there and I do my 10 minute meditation in the morning I do my ball class I do a yoga but also having a space in your house where you can actually you know do that that's dedicated so you're not trying to fit it in in the kitchen or you know in my dining room um, or just using the outside I mean I put on a pair of shoes and go Mm -hmm. Walk, jog, take a pair of hand weights with you. I do that sometimes, either two or three pounds. Sometimes after an hour walking or jogging, those three pound weights get really heavy. <laughs> um, but just finding something that you love to do. And I think once you get started moving your body, there's definitely an impact on your mental health, the endorphins, the fresh air. And actually, instead of running on a treadmill, if you go run outside, you know, in the winter, you just buy a pair of wool socks, you know, get some better clothes, um, you know, a couple different layers. And once you start running, you get hot and then you don't need the layers. But the scenery changes. So instead of staring at that wall or the TV in the gym, you know, the tree and throughout the seasons, this is what I love about hiking. Every time I go on the same trail, it looks differently. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the sun's in a different position. There's different people out. There's, you know, the, the trees shed their leaves, the sounds of the stream. It just puts you in a different space. So there's just, there's so many different ways. And I think so often people focus on, I have to go to the gym, I have to go on that piece of equipment, and I have to mm -hmm. you know, get on the treadmill. And if you can really think outside the box, <laughs> there's so many ways to move your body. So well, the, I, that <laughs> I appreciate that response. I really, really do. I'm, I, I guess I, my wife uh, has worked with a, in, in healthcare with an elderly population or predominantly elderly population. And one of the things, that um, she's observed and which I've observed as well is, is that as we age, the, uh, the pace at which starting, I think it's about age 30, but it really starts to accelerate at age 60, um, you start to lose on an annual basis, barring any sort of efforts on your part to, to interrupt or interfere with this, there's a natural loss of muscle mass. Mm -hmm. And so unless you're doing something to, to 
to counteract that inherent, that natural loss of muscle mass, you're losing a fairly steady percentage each year. In addition, if, if you don't have anything that's, that's, that's um, challenging your skeleton, you're also losing bone density. And okay. it's the, the combination of um, diminished muscularity as well as weakened bones makes us more susceptible to serious injury with even a minor fall. And with the um, with the net result being that the the fall produces these injuries from which many people never ever recover. So I'm thinking, you know, by the time you're in your 50s or your 60s, if you can be focused on if you can be focused on making sure that you're you're getting your um, you know you're getting your exercise in and preventing that loss of muscularity, so much so much the better. So. Let me, just, if I don't, if you don't mind, I want to switch to back to the diet subject for a bit. And so here again, I'm just going to start with the story. So my wife is so much better than I about being able to say no to things. I mean, I'm Mr. Impulse and she's Mrs. Discipline. It's just unbelievable why in the world we're together. I, I sometimes, I, I don't, I, I, I lucked out. I don't know what she was thinking, but in any, any case, we're, we're together. So she, uh, she slices up vegetables, puts them in a, in a little Tupperware, and they're ready to go in the refrigerator all the time to snack on, where my go-to would otherwise be a bag of Doritos or you know some, a, slice of a few slices of cheese, which will wind up being many slices of cheese or whatever the case might be. But um, my daughter helped us out with a little trick that I think has been a huge blessing to me, and that is get some of those greens triple washed if you need if you're lazy like I am get the triple washed spinach or the triple washed greens mm -hmm. put it in a bowl and then there's three things that you add and it's just when I realized this is so simple in addition to a little in my case low fat dressing is add some nuts add some cheese add some dry fruit nuts cheese dry fruit nuts cheese dried fruit so with that formula you know, I wound up eating a lot of salads and I'm as you said earlier getting the greens and then the last thing is that I really tried to cut the fat out and add in the protein. So do you, do you, in your, so with that story is sort of the context. Again, here's your chance for a major reprimand number two. Um, <laughs> is there something in that you'd say, I, d I don't agree that that's the, the, a sensible dietary strategy or there, there, or is there something in there that you'd say, uh, yes, that, that's a handy way to get at what you're, what you're recommending your clients do? Well, I think, um, Moving away from the bag of Doritos to, to what we call whole foods um, or you know real food that's not in the process. I think mm -hmm. that's actually if you go back you know half an hour ago into our discussion of what else would you you know the basic things to do um, is trying to shift from away from processed foods to you know single ingredient whole foods. Mm -hmm. You know eat the apple instead of the bag of potato chips. Um, but I think that's a great start. One of the things you want to think about is the sugar content. So when you're looking at dried fruit, um, how much sugar is mm -hmm. in it mm -hmm. and keeping that to a minimum. So maybe have a little bit of the dried fruit with more of the nuts. Mm -hmm. um, cheese is something that some people can tolerate, some people can't, you know, dairy issues. Um, the, the other thing that really we, we discuss in, in my coaching is everyone's physical body is different. Everybody takes in, um, you know, you can, I was actually watching something on Netflix the other night, my son showed me, you know, and they, they val validated this is your own um, body makeup, the, the, your gut microbiome, the health of, of your body really has an impact on what you're putting in your mouth and how your body's reacting to those foods. Um, some of the simple things um, that I would do um, with a client for, coaching is just like a pantry makeover and a, and a refrigerator review um, and the first thing that we look at is where are the sh where are the hidden sugars oh. um, and try and reduce those things mm -hmm. um, if, if you pull out you know those great protein bars you know I, 20 grams of protein this is great after my workout and you turn over the label and it's got 40 grams of sugar on it I'm like well maybe not the best you know maybe go home and have you know a chicken leg or you oh. know a, two hard-boiled eggs or something like that instead um, so really looking at the, the ingredients, and that's where if you're eating single ingredient whole foods, well, what are the ingredients in an apple? Well, 
it's an apple. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, it's not, you know, you look at some of those bags and boxes of food and there's 20 items and, and you can't pronounce half of them. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think the greens with, you know, the nuts and a little bit of cheese and the dried fruit, it's moving you, you know, away from the processed items into things that actually have vitamins and minerals in them to help replenish your body. Um, so it's, it's definitely a start and it's really, it's really individual. You know, what are your goals and what are you trying to achieve? But I definitely agree because I'm in that age range now where, okay, the muscle mass is going down and, and the bone density, you know, we have osteoporosis in the family and I'm very, very aware of that. Um, you know, and I, I spoke actually to my chiropractor about that. I'm like, what do you suggest? You know, they talk about getting on all these medications for the osteoporosis and not that I'm going to be a rheumatologist and, and diagnose or, or give advice here on that. But one of the, the single most important things people keep talking about is weight bearing exercise um, because the stress you put on your bones actually will help promote bone growth mm -hmm. on that side and balance is the other thing um, because why do actually <laughs> the my practitioner said to me she says well if you work on your balance and you have really good balance your likelihood of falling is a lot less mm -hmm. and you know we don't think about those things um, but if you have good balance in your body even if you trip on something and, and I've tripped on things recently when I've been out um, jogging but I've been able to catch myself because my center of gravity and my balance has you know, brought me back to prevent that fall. Mm. And I, I know, you know, el some elderly people that I know, their balance is so horrible, whether their spine's not aligned or they're just, their core muscles are not strong enough and their balance is so bad that even if their bones are in good shape, they may be injured when they fall. So things like yoga and Pilates can really work on that core um, to keep you more balanced so that your likelihood of falling is less. And then the weight bearing exercise is good for, you know, improving, you know, or, or promoting some bone growth, but it also builds the muscles so that you can lift those things. You know, even I saw, <laughs> I saw one commercial um, during early in the pandemic where it's like, well, I can't get to the gym. And they said, well, take your reusable grocery bag and just go into your cabinet and, you know, or your refrigerator and put a gallon of milk in it and just start doing, you know, bicep curls with a gallon of milk, you know, get inventive. You've got right. things in your house that you can do. It's just, we're so trained to have to be in the gym with the 10 pound weight. And there's so many ways to get at these things um, without going down the conventional road. Um, and I think people got really creative, you know, during the last few months on, on mm -hmm. what to do mm -hmm. to, to move your body and having to not be able to be in the gym and, and how can I get my exercise. Yeah. Jill, uh, you mentioned working on your balance. How do you do that? So there's a lot of different um, exercise work. Um, the core is really, I think, I'm, I'm not a trainer, so I'll put that qualifier right. out to begin with. I'm, um, but just through my own um, work, I've been doing yoga for about, I don't know, the last 14 years. And it works on your core. And with every pose that you do in yoga, you know, you work on your right side, you work on your left side. And so over time, between both yoga and Pilates, you're working on your core to strengthen, you know, the midsection. And that helps your body stay aligned on both sides. And there's... Um, have you ever heard of like the BOSU balls? It's like that half um, half ball and the, the bottom is flat. So if you turn it upside down, you know, you're standing on it. And some people, the first time they get on it, they can't balance it. But people say, oh, I have no balance and I, I can't do these balance exercises. Well, you got to start somewhere. And, you know, you stand on it and maybe you can stand on it for five seconds and you do it again the next day. And just by doing it more and more, your body will learn how to stay in balance and I would suggest if, if that's something you know you want to work on is go talk to a trainer and they've got you know their whole here's all the exercises to work on balance um, whether it's on a ball or you know different core exercises there's a lot of different things that you can do specifically focused on balance and I think there's a lot of trainers out there today um, and you probably <laughs> maybe bring one of them on on your show that work with the elderly there's there's people who are targeting um, just working with people uh, who want to work on osteoporosis. There's people who work on, um, you know, just with Parkinson's patients. There's classes that work on 
the things that work with the motor skills for different um, diseases. So there's people out there who are skilled in working on all these specific issues, and balance is one of them um, that you know you could definitely impact. I had another question I thought of when Eric mentioned his story of the salad, are there any other like simple, what I'll call almost lazy ways to eat healthy that come to mind? So I think preparation is really important. Um, I think often in our busy lives, you know, we're, when we were, were commuting somewhere or you'd come home or even now it's sometimes worse that you're at home because your, your boundaries work and you know home boundaries are even blurred even more um, is is preparing and making sure you have healthy options available like Eric said you know the, those items were already cut up so if I would go in, I used to do this with my kids I'd make sure I had carrots and celery cut up and even though I wouldn't necessarily want the ranch dressing it was you know okay I'll give you the ranch dressing <laughs> and I'd make sure that it was already cut up in the refrigerator because if they looked in the fridge it's like oh I have to take it out I have to cut it up they wouldn't mm -hmm. do it um, so having things that are already prepared, and even if that means you have to buy, you know, you go to Whole Foods or Giant or wherever you shop and you buy the stuff that's already cut up, it costs a little more, but if it's in the house <laughs> and it's there and you open the fridge, up, oh, celery's there, you know, put some almond butter on it or sun butter if you're allergic to nuts. Um, you know, there's just the preparation, having things on hand, having healthy choices on hand even when we would go places, um, I would always bring snacks with because I didn't want us to be um, defaulting to we have to buy the ice cream, we have to buy out of the vending machine. And I, you know, they used to laugh at me, but I would have a little bag with me and I'd have, you know, healthy options, whether it was, you know, carrying some apples with us or mandarin oranges that, you know, you could grab out the fruit um, and have that readily available. And it's the same thing with meal prep for during the week. You can cut up a lot of your vegetables that you would put in a salad and put them in glass containers in your fridge. So you have, okay, my lettuce is all chopped up. I've chopped up tomatoes. I've chopped up the carrots, the cucumbers, whatever items you like to put in your salads. And you know, you want to take a half an hour break to eat lunch. You don't have to sit there and chop. You just go in, dump, 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 dump. You know, put on some little olive oil, maybe some salt and pepper, some lemon juice. You don't even need the bottle of dressing. You can just pour olive oil right out of the bottle and that's what I do <laughs> I got lazy so I just open the olive oil pour it on pour you know squeeze some lemon juice and there's a lot of you know lemons limes you can use things like that to make a really nice dressing for your salad um, without having the bottled dressing which if you turn those around and look at the back there's a lot of sugar in those too um, like you said nuts seeds I top my salads with pumpkin seeds um, the nuts and seeds add a lot there's proteins, there's omegas in some of them, there's um, some healthy fats, topping with an avocado. I always have avocados in my house. <laughs> so there's a lot of different things. It's, it takes some preparation, but once you move into that space of knowing how to shop for things and prepping, a lot of people spend uh, part of their Sunday doing meal prep for the whole week. And so, you know, Monday night, Tuesday night comes, all they do is take it out of the fridge, throw it in the oven, and it's done or throw it in a skillet. Um, stir fries are really good things to um, add healthy food. You can throw in all kinds of fresh vegetables, whether it's your, you know, chop up some onions, garlic, um, throw in pea pods, throw in green beans. I mean, sometimes I'll, if I haven't bought fresh, I'll go into the freezer and I'll always have, you know, some spinach or um, frozen green beans. And you just dump them in the stir fry with some olive oil and they'll defrost and cook up and it's really quick. And you know, if you have like a chicken breast or um, you know whatever protein you like, it cooks really fast. So stir fries are actually really um, easy, quicker ways to make a fast dinner with healthy you know vegetables in them. So uh, one of the uh, the questions that I would like us to just address is I, I th because I think for many people, it's not that they don't know. Um, that they should do something, it's not knowing, it's what they lack is, is both knowing how to do it, but even beyond knowing how to do it, it's having the will to do it. So we've been talking a lot about the how, and I'm sure there are other ways of doing it, but in terms of finding the willpower 
to, do, to initiate and then sustain these sorts of changes in your lives, what are some of the things that you have found helpful to people to, to get on a, on a new track and get on a success track with their health? So I think it goes back to something <clears throat> I spoke about at the beginning. It's, it's what's your why? Why do you want to do this? You know, can, can you envision the 10 years down the road, five years down the road, 30 years down the road? What do you want your life to look like? Um, and, and keeping that front and center. I want to be healthy and be around for my children. Or, you know, I, I want to be able to vacation in my retirement somewhere else. So I want to live long enough to be healthy during that time. And it, a mindset shift, like focusing on your why and putting post-its in your on your bathroom mirror on your you know in your car you know what's my why and constantly having that in front of you so that you focus on I, not that I just oh I have to get healthy but I want to be healthy because I want to live and be able to not be in a nursing home I want to be independent when I'm 80 and be able to still drive and do the activities I want to with my friends um, the other thing that um, I think people don't realize or, or don't focus on is why do I eat the way I do? Like, what's your relationship with food? Um, and this is, can be a whole nother, <laughs> a whole nother, you know, our subject. But often we eat what we do, how we do, why we do because of our relationship with food. You know, do you sit down with a bowl of ice cream at night because you're by yourself and you want company and it's comforting? Um, instead of you know finding something else sweet to eat you know maybe you have a little bit of like coconut yogurt and you throw some blueberries on it which are sweet but you're not getting all that sugar you know so identifying and this is where a coach would come in to sit with you and you know talk about what do you eat when are you eating and actually doing a food diary you know they say do it for like two weeks but most people can't sustain a food diary for more than like two or three days but even that two or three days is, is very telling. What do you eat for breakfast? What do you eat for lunch? What do you, when do you snack? What is it that you're reaching for? And there's a whole philosophy around cravings. Like, what am I craving? Am I craving something crunchy? Well, maybe I, instead of having a bowl of popcorn, I can have a carrot. I still get that crunch. You know, often you know, people, they just want some crunchy food. And learning why you have the habits you do and then finding something to replace it with. So if you're, for example, lonely in the evening, you're by yourself and you know, you, you, the food keeps you company. So figuring out when, when you can come to that realization, oh, I'm eating at night because it brings me comfort. What can I do in the evening to bring me comfort? Can I call a friend? Can I read a book? Can I use switching out habits and finding ways to deal with the emotional piece of your eating with something that's not food because i think so many of us have so much emotion tied up in our food we eat when we're happy we eat when we're sad we eat when we celebrate everything we eat when we're angry we <laughs> if you look at a lot of reasons why people eat and really examine it food's everywhere in our life and when you look at and, and this is a whole nother conversation is is media when you go you know over the next 24 hours you know watch some tv especially on the weekends when there's sports and, and these look at and I'll, I'll leave brand names off the conversation but look at the ads food is always food and alcohol are always attached to you know the sports games the celebrations and yes we we do eat to celebrate in many cultures we eat to celebrate but what you eat can make a big difference you know, you don't have to have the high calorie, the high sugar, the high fat food. There, you can eat really healthy food that really tastes well if you learn how to cook, and you and it's not difficult to learn. And you learn how to use seasonings and herbs and spices that can make food so delicious. It doesn't have to be the sugar. The the last piece I have on that is, people need to be more kind to themselves so much of this you know oh willpower people used to say to me because i would always bring my my salad for lunch and then oh you eat so healthy and you you always bring a salad you're so good i'm like no i'm not good i've made a choice 
because I want to be healthy and I actually like the way the food tastes, you know. Some of it's crunchy, some of it's sweet. I put different things in it so that I get, you know, the crunchy things, I put some raisins in, I've got the squishy things and they have a little bit of sweetness to them. You know, so you can get all of those things with, within healthy choices. But depending on what is in your gut, your gut microbiome, and this can also be a whole nother <laughs> topic, if you've got a lot of bad bacteria in your gut, it feeds off sugar. And until you get that corrected, your body is naturally craving that and you may not have so much control over it. Mm. You're craving it because you're, the bacteria in your gut, and there's so much now nutritional science about the, the gut microbiome and bacteria. You're starting to hear a lot more about this um, out in a little bit more mainstream but definitely in functional medicine and integrative medicine practices, they start in the gut. And once you can kind of turn that situation around and you can eliminate the excess like sugars in your diet, you stop craving them. Mm -hmm. I mean, I used to eat the donuts just like everybody else. You get the box of Krispy Kreme, and, oh, you have one, you have two, and by the time you're third, you can't take the sugar anymore. <laughs> but I look at that now and I have no desire to eat it because I've changed my habits and I look at that and I say, that's unhealthy and it's not gonna feed me. So it's not gonna feed my soul, it's not gonna feed my body. And if you start looking at food as, is this helping my body or hurting my body? Is it helping my brain function or not? Mm -hmm. um, it's really changing the relationship with food. And it, it takes some time and it doesn't have to be a, oh my God, I'm, I'm going sugar-free tomorrow. You know, it's put blueberries in instead of you know the sugar or add i'm not a coffee drinker so i, I can't really speak to the, the coffee habits but there, there's ways to what we call crowd out you swap a for b and you do that for a week and then you kind of move to the next thing and some people need to do it really slowly so they don't have this jump off the cliff i'm, I'm going sugar free overnight for some people they have to do that like nope going sugar free overnight from tomorrow i'm never having sugar again um, sometimes those aren't sustainable. So Jill, I, I, I'm, I love this conversation. I wanted to keep going, but I also recognize I'm, I'm mindful of the time that we've been talking for a little while. And so I think Roshan and I may each have one more question, but before we get to that, those questions, I want to um, let our listeners know how they can contact you, because I'm sure that there are some people that are saying, um, you know, this, the, the, what Jill is saying makes uh, imminent amount of sense to me and I just need to figure out how I get some accountability and I get some help and I get some insight and I get this kind of wisdom so how would people reach out to you and and connect with you if they're looking for for help from you so the best thing to do I would suggest is to use my website um, my website is yodayawellness.com it's y-o-d-a-y-a -A wellness um, and actually, the, my, my tagline is where knowledge feeds transformation. Mm. Um, because you can know all of this information. But like you said, if you're not going to act on it, then you're, you're not going to change your habits. Um, so on my website, there is a place to contact me. Um, you can email directly jill at yodeawellness.com as well. Um, and there's actually, I have a... a uh, I think what's up there now might be a sugar cleanse sheet. You know, just a cube. you can go and register for that. You know, read the website, learn a little bit more about health coaching. Um, there's a lot of information on the website about what a health coach is, what it does, um, different information. There are some recipes. Um, there's a blog that I have started and also a lot of resources from um, the school that I studied at, which um, I'll plug them here, the Institute for Integrative Nutrition, um, trains, you know, integrative health coaches. Um, their blog is also on my site, so there's a lot of different information about how to start healthy habits. Um, but I think either, you know, my email, jill at yodeawellness.com or directly at the website um, where they can find a lot more resources as well is the best way to reach me. Great. Because I, I'm convinced that the, the first step on this journey is the hardest step on this journey. <laughs> and so taking that first step and it, it even if it's excruciatingly hard to take will every single step thereafter will be easier than the first one and getting accountability 
and insight is is the key i think trying to do this on your own alone is a really hard thing to do so i appreciate your doing that so roshan did you uh did you have any sort of wrap-up questions that you wanted to pose i i have two things first the question then is just want to highlight something so jill you mentioned sugar so many times is that the top offender of our diet as americans in general it it's really one that's that's really up there there are, are, are two really two issues that are at the root of a lot of things one is sugar mm -hmm. and one is stress um, so focusing on sugar um, there are so many studies that show that sugar is more addictive than the opiates mm, and wow. when you look at it at that level it's like oh my god <laughs> Um, there, there are studies out there you can Google and, and find how addictive sugar is. And you know the, the bad bacteria in your gut feed on them. So mm -hmm. the more your gut is out of balance, the more it wants it and it craves it and it craves it. And, and you know the story. You sit down with a box of Oreos and you eat one. Oh, I'm gonna have another one. And you find yourself in behaviors that you look and see half the box is gone. How the heck did I do that? I only wanted to eat one, but you, really without any mindfulness you know just keep feeding yeah. you sit down with the pint of ice cream i'm just going to have one scoop and you eat half the pint or the whole pint yeah. um so it really is it's an addictive substance and so many of our the processed foods if you like after today go home and look through your cupboard um, and you don't have to report back to me but turn over the back labels and just look at um, all the different foods where there's added sugars um, whether it's the tomato sauce or the salad dressing, the protein bars, the cereals that you, you know, your kids might have for breakfast. It's pervasive in so many processed foods. And it's not just, it's not just gonna say cane sugar. It's gonna say high fructose corn syrup. It's gonna say sucrose, dextrose, you know, anything with an OSE on the end. Um, the brown rice sugar, even things, you know, maple syrup, I um, mean, some of those are, are, are healthier to have in your diet, but go look at the grams of sugar. The bottle of ketchup, there's one for you. Go look at the back of your ketchup bottle if you have ketchup in your house. That's yes. shocking. Um, so how much ketchup do you pour on your french fries? Um, you know, if you make sweet potato fries, you know, those can be healthy to eat. When you make, you know, regular fries and pour ketchup all over them, how much sugar are you consuming? So it's not the potato that's bad, <laughs> it's all the sugar in the ketchup. Um, so really expanding your knowledge on what you're actually putting in your body. But yes, sugar is, if you can get a handle on what we call the white foods, the white flour, the white sugar. Um, and I'm not saying everyone needs to go gluten free because you know, a lot of people can handle gluten. I for one cannot handle it, but um, the swapping out things. So you know, people are like, oh, cauliflower pizza crust. You know, if you want your pizza, you know, get a cauliflower crust. There, you can do so much with cauliflower now, and it's a vegetable, it has nutrients in it, it is less calories. Um, so there's a lot of things that you can swap out, you know, it's called these food hacks, where you can still have kind of what you wanted to eat made with some different ingredients. And sometimes it takes a little adjustment to, you know, oh, it tastes a little different. But when you start eating it and you get the, the sugar taste out of your mouth and out of your taste buds, they actually taste really good. And the seasonings and the herbs and spices that you can put in them, you can have such beautiful food that's not made with sugar, that tastes good, that's nutritious, that's healthy. Um, it's possible, <laughs> it really is. It's just, it's a shift in mindset. It's really a shift in mindset and a focus on, you know, what do I want my body to be for? You know, there, there are several sayings out there, you know, you only have, if, if you don't take care of your body, where are you gonna live? You know, things like that yeah. um, and you don't get another one you know one of the things that I kind of focus on sometimes is you know we buy these fancy cars and we keep them washed and clean and vacuumed and we put premium gas in them and we take such good care of our cars especially you know, I probably shouldn't say this but a lot of the you know men out there they're so proud of their cars and they take care of it but they don't take care of the body and say so, okay well you know oh they live in their car they're in their car all the time everybody's looking at me with my fancy car but what are you doing with your own body? That's where you actually live. That's where your, your spirit, your soul, you, that's where you live every day. And, and how are you taking care of the house you live in every day? <laughs>
Yeah, that's a great point. I Good thought point. Of, when you mentioned the car, I thought of the premium gas, right? Are you like, comparing that to organic food in my mind? The question I asked earlier. Um, uh, there was one other thing I just wanted to mention. I really liked when you were talking about your story with the salad where you said, well, I'm, I made a choice to be healthy. And I think especially with this being around the new year and the resolutions I mentioned earlier, that it is, it is a choice, just like Eric, your doctor gave you the choice. Do you want uh, diet and exercise or do you want the drugs, right? So I would just encourage all our listeners to make, uh, to know that they are making a choice, even if it's to do nothing, that's, that's a choice. And Jill is here to help you if, uh, if you need help in getting your health and wellness in order. Uh, as I always say, thank you very much for listening to the Retirement Lifestyle Show. Please like, subscribe. All of Jill's information will be in the show notes. And uh, please give us five stars and we'll be back to you next week. Thank you for listening.